Welcome to the 12th and final lecture of our second semester class on stochastic processes. Today we discuss, as a highlight, the family of logarithmic Sobolev inequalities that we can study in the context of uh, Markov processes. These inequalities are also belonging to this class of so-called functional inequalities like the Poincaré inequality. And the logarithmic Sobolev inequality is an amplification in some sense of a Poincaré inequality. And it will lead to much stronger consequences regarding the quantitative be uh, behavior or the convergence towards equilibrium of a Markov process on the one hand. And on, this, on the other hand, it will have enormous consequences for the behavior of the fundamental solution to the corresponding parabolic equation. It will also be important in the context, for instance, of statistical mechanics when you want to study the uh, scaling limit of um, interacting particle systems, for instance, when you are interested in quantitative behavior, quantitative conversions to local equilibrium, and so forth. So, without going into much of details about the applications of the logarithmic Sobolev inequalities, uh, let me just uh, try to convince you that it has enormous amount of consequences, and when we have a Markov process for which we can establish a logarithmic Sobolev inequality, we are typically very happy because we can then make much stronger statements. Um, we will give some indication later why it is actually so, but let me first uh, start by stating what I shall understand by a logarithmic Sobolev inequality in the context of a Fela process. So we have a Fela generator on a certain topological space with a symmetrizing, and here by symmetrizing I mean symmetrizing an invariant measure, mu, then I'm saying that this generator together with the measure satisfies a logarithmic Sobolev inequality. If there is a positive constant, finite constant, such that for all functions in the domain of the generator, the following inequality holds true. On the left-hand side of this inequality, we have a curious term, which is reminiscent of an entropy, and in fact it is to be understood as an entropy. So it involves the integration of a certain function, but not the function itself, but the function uh, times its logarithmic, uh, times the, the log of that function, where here the function is the square. And on the right-hand side, we have the quadratic form, which is induced from this symmetric operator on this weighted measure space, which we also sometimes call the Dirichlet form. So that inequality with a finite constant c is correct. For all functions f in the domain of the generator, at least, then we say that the process or the corresponding semigroup or the corresponding generator together with that measure satisfy a logarithmic Sobolev inequality. We start the discussion of this family of inequalities with a few remarks. First, uh, you can convince yourself that uh, it is sufficient to establish this inequality for the case that the L2 norm with regards to mu of the function f is equal to 1 because else you just pass to the, in the other case, you would just pass to the normalized version and establish then the general inequality above from the special case easily. So therefore we can assume, in fact, without loss of generality, that the L2 norm of the function is equal to 1, which allows us to introduce a new probability measure on our space, which is a perturbation of the invariant measure by means of the function f squared as rado nucleum derivative. And then the left-hand side of this inequality, which is written out here once again in this case, can also be represented as the logarithm of the logarithm, uh, the logarithm of the rado nucleum derivative of this new measure nu against the measure invariant measure mu integrated against the measure mu, which is the classical representation uh, of the Rennie entropy of the measure nu against the measure mu. So therefore, on the left-hand side, you have, in fact, the conventional entropy, which you know from equilibrium statistical mechanics, for instance, or from information theory, where one should probably say that in mathematics, we typically deal with the negative of the physical entropy. So modulo the plus-minus ambiguity, we, have, we can see that the left-hand side is exactly the entropy of this uh, new measure against the equilibrium measure. And on the right-hand side, again writing new as this perturbed measure, then the right-hand side 
is uh, sometimes called the Fisher information, or in statistics or information theory, this is called the Fisher information of the measure nu against the measure mu. So therefore you see that in uh, statistical or, uh, or physical terms, the logarithmic Sobolev inequality says that the, uh, that the entropy of a measure is bounded from above by a uniform constant times the Fisher information of that measure with regards uh, to the equilibrium measure mu. Here's our first indication why we are interested in a logarithmic Sobolev inequality, which is a stronger form of a convergence statement for the semigroup acting not on functions, but in this case on measures. Namely, suppose we have a Markov process or Feller process with generator A and DA that satisfies the logarithmic Sobolev inequality with a logarithmic Sobolev constant C. Then it is so that for all probability measures on our state space, we can bound the distance of the action of the adjoint semigroup acting on that measure towards the equilibrium measure, but now measured in terms of the relative entropy of that measure, pt star nu against mu, in terms of the entropy of the measure of the starting measure nu alone, but with a, an exponential decay rate on the right-hand side, which is basically given by the inverse of this logarithmic constant, of the logarithmic sublift constant, times a factor 4. This is then the exponential contraction rate. So we have an exponential contraction on an exponential convergence in entropy of the trajectories on measure space, which we obtain by evolving a given initial measure nu through the action of the adjoint semigroup. And then this trajectory will, or this dynamical system on the set of measures, will converge towards the equilibrium measure at an exponential rate when we measure the difference between that trajectory or the state of that trajectory with regards to that measure in entropy. And the convergence rate, let me say it again, this exponential convergence rate is four times the inverse of the logarithmic Sobolev constant. The statement is quite true in very general situations, and uh, for simplicity, nevertheless, we will give a proof of this statement only in the case that we are dealing with a gradient drift diffusion equation of non-explosive type. So when x, or the corresponding Feller semigroup, is given by a solution to a stochastic differential equation, dxt equals minus gradient of h of xt dt plus dwt in d-dimensional Euclidean space. In this case, the equilibrium measure is of the form 1 over z e to the minus h of z uh, dx, so just the usual Gibbs measure with the fu function h as Hamiltonian. And we are interested in the evolution of the action of an arbitrary probability measure under the action of the adjoint semigroup. So the only interesting case that produces uh, something which is not infinite on the right-hand side of the inequality is when the measure nu, which we start with, is given uh, in terms of a radon nicodem density perturbation of the measure mu with a certain function f. And if we ask ourselves what the what is the evolution of this measure, so if uh, nu t is defined to be the evolution of, of this measure under the adjoint action of the semigroup, then we can write nu t evaluated on the set A is, of course, the integral of the indicator function of the set A against this nu t measure. And um, since, the, since so by, by duality, we can also write this as an application of the pt semigroup on the indicator function evaluated against the measure nu, but the measure nu is given as uh, a radon nicodem density f against the measure mu, so that therefore this um, this way uh, is, is correct to write that, that evaluation. But by symmetry of the semigroup, we can uh, map this PT operation, which is acting on the indicator function, equivalently to be a PT operation acting on the function f integrated against the measure mu, which altogether uh, produces the conclusion that the evolution of this new measure under the action PT is nothing but uh, the measure 
which is uh, given by the Radonukodim derivative of PTF against against the measure mu. So the propagation of this measure mu under the action is nothing but replacing the initial function f with the propagated function PTF under the action of the same group PT. So writing in the sequel writing rho t as the corresponding density, namely PTF, uh, we are then interested ultimately um, in the evolution of this quantity, which is writing out what we obtain if we write out the entropy of nu t with regards to the measure mu. It's the, the entropy is the integral of the rho log rho function against the measure mu, where here the rho depends on t. And we are interested in the evolution of this quantity, so therefore a natural thing to do is to study the time derivative of this quantity. Uh, by sufficient regularity, we can assume that we can move the time derivative operation inside the integral. Inside the integral, we have a product of two functions depending on time t, so therefore by Leibniz rule, we expect two terms, or two summons, the one, the first one is the operation is, is d by dt of rho t, which is a of rho t, then it multiplied with the second factor, log of rho t, integrated against the mu. And the second summit is the rho t, not differentiated, then multiplied with the derivative of log rho t. But by chain rule, the derivative of log rho t is 1 over rho t times the derivative of rho t, which is a rho t, and then again integrated against the measure mu. And we study the two terms independently, I argue now that the second term is actually zero. Why so? Well, <clears throat> the rho t is here, of course, cancel, and I'm left with a rho t, but by definition of a as the generator of the semigroup, I can also write this integral as the time derivative of nu t integrated against the one function, but since the solution is assumed to be non-explosive, the semigroup is conservative, so therefore rho t or nu t is a probability measure for all times, so therefore, this term here is a constant 1 for all times, and the derivative with relation to time, of course, vanishes. So therefore, in fact, the second summit does not contribute, and we are left with this quadratic form here, or this <coughs> bilinear form on the left-hand side, which we gave the name curly E before, with a minus. But here we have the corresponding quadratic form, which is generated by the operator A, uh, acting or evaluated on, in this bilinear fashion on the pair of functions rho t and ln of rho t. Okay, so that's what we obtain. <clears throat> and we have already convinced ourselves in one of the previous lectures that, that in the special case of, a, of this uh, gradient drift diffusion equation, when mu is the canonical equilibrium measure, then this quadratic form is nothing but the inner product of the two gradients of the functions times the or integrated against the equilibrium measure mu. But uh, invoking the chain rule for the gradient, again, we can write this as a minus 1 over rho t for the gradient of log rho t times rho t, gradient of rho t integrated into rho t. And this we can write in a symmetrized form or symmetric form in terms of, um, of the gradients of the square root of the rho function, so at the expense of a factor 4. So this expression after all, this Dirichlet form evaluated on this product can also be written as, if you want, as minus 4 times the Dirichlet form on the gradient of the row, gradient of the row. And in this form, we recognize that this is uh, the right-hand side of our logarithmic Sobolev inequality in the case when the density is not given as an f squared, but here the density is given as a row, so therefore instead of writing an f into, the, so we have to take the square root effectively of the density and insert this into this quadratic form. Here the density is rho, so therefore in fact we get the right-hand side of our Poincaré inequality. But by the Poincaré inequality, this term here on the right-hand side without the minus is an upper bound for the corresponding entropy of the measure. But with the minus sign we get an equality in the other way around, with the, with the, we get an upper bound. Uh, with the inverse of the uh, Poincaré constant appearing now here as a factor. And on the right-hand side, we get the, uh, the, the entropy of the corresponding measure. And as before, we know that rho t for all times is a probability measure, so this term here in the uh, denominator is a 1. So 
after all, we get just the entropy again of the measure mu t against the measure mu. And now if we compare the terms, <clears throat> we started with the entropy, we took the derivative of this entropy, and we find that the derivative of this entropy is bounded from above by minus 4 over c times the entropy again. So we have a Grunwald structure, we can apply the Grunwald uh, inequality and conclude uh, right away that the statement is actually correct. So we have seen that once we have the logarithmic sublet inequality, this entropy contraction is a straightforward consequence, which is just obtained by taking the differential of the entropy along the flow which is induced from this, uh, from this, uh, from on the set of measures induced from this uh, evolution of probabilities. So, a few more remarks before we go on. <clears throat> uh, it is correct, and I leave it as an exercise to convince yourself that for gradient drift diffusions as above, uh, the inverse implication is also true. So, in fact, the logarithmic Sobolev inequality is equivalent in this case to this exponential decay of entropy along the heat flow. This is a simple exercise, just going the computations that we did just the other way around, so to say. And for Markov chains, also the implications of the actual statement that I, that I made is also correct. There is a little bit of uh, complication coming into the game when you deal with Markov chains because typically you don't have the chain rule that we use here for this operator. So certain uh, algebraic manipulations above do not, uh, do not uh, hold true in this case. But um, fortunately, there is one inequality which saves the statement also, at least in the direction which we showed, also in the Markov chain case, which is that this Dirichlet form EF log F is an upper bound um, but to uh, two times the Dirichlet form evaluated on the square root of the function f. That's a non-trivial uh, inequality, which is correct even for Markov chains, and you find that proof, is a, or you can try to prove it yourself, uh, which is a simple kind of um, type of young inequality, uh, or you can look it up in uh, the paper by Salof Cost from Analysis of Probability from 1969. And the second remark that I would like to make is that um, typical typical application is the question how far the two distributions are away from each other. Entropy is not always, <clears throat> for all applications, the right quantity to measure distances between measures, but there is a Pinsker's inequality for arbitrary measures, which gives an upper bound for the total variation distance of two measures, which is for um, certain applications, the natural distance to consider in order to see how far two measures are away from each other. And the Pinsker inequality says that the total variation distance between two measures can be bounded from above by the entropy of, the, of one measure against the other. And so therefore we find that if we have an upper bound for the distance in entropy, we also have an upper bound in total variation distance so therefore, for algorithmic applications, we find that if we have logarithmic sublet inequality, we also have exponential convergence of the uh, finite time measure towards the equilibrium measure in total variation distance, which is, as I said again, a consequence of this Pinsky inequality. So you can try to prove that Pinsky inequality yourself, or you look it up, for instance, uh, the proof of it. You can find this in the lecture notes by Eberle, for instance. So that gives a justification why first justification why we are interested from, say, an algorithmic point of view in logarithmic Sobolev inequalities. We will now come to a classical statement about the validity of a logarithmic Sobolev constant in the case of gradient drift diffusion processes under a certain convexity assumption on the Hamiltonian function H. So the convexity assumption on the Hamiltonian will be formulated as follows. Let H be a smooth function on d-dimensional Euclidean space, then this function is called uniformly k-convex for a certain real number k, which might be positive or negative, doesn't matter, if it is true so that the Hessian, so the second order derivative of this function, is bounded from below by, by k at any point in space. So this is to be understood in the sense of quadratic forms, it says that for all vectors of dimension d, 
we have that the corresponding quadratic form, which is obtained by multiplying the vector psi with the Hessian and then taking that into the inner product with the vector psi itself, so just the standard quadratic form induced from this symmetric matrix. If that quadratic form is an upper bound for the corresponding square norm quadratic form multiplied with a factor k. That's true for any point x in space where you evaluate the Hessian and for any vector psi, then we call the function uniformly k-convex. And this notion makes sense even if k is negative, then we would say that the defect of convexity for that function is uh, no less, or is the, 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 the function is at least as is maximally non-convex, and the <clears throat> function or the number k gives a quantitative statement on the maximal non-convexity of the function. But here, in uh, the sequel below, we shall be interested, in fact, in the case when k is actually, actually strictly positive. And that's now the statement of the next proposition, which is very classical, meanwhile, and uh, it's certainly something that everybody uh, should know and effectively knows who has ever been exposed to this kind of analysis or the law of mixed inequalities. And this statement goes like this. If we have the generator of a fellow semi-group on Euclidean space, which is associated again to our gradient diffusion type process, where we want to assume that this process um, is, well, we don't have to assume it. In fact, <clears throat> if we uh, understand or if we require that the function uh, H is in fact K-convex, with strictly strictly positive k, say, so the case k being equal to zero, the lower bound is a, is a degenerate case, so let us assume for simplicity, as a matter of fact, that this number k is strictly positive. Then the corresponding equilibrium measure of this Gibbs type, together with the generator A, satisfy a Poincaré and a logarithmic Sobolev inequality with constant 1 over k and 1 over 2k, respectively. So the short statement, the short form of this statement is if you consider a gradient diffusion process on Euclidean space and if the corresponding Hamiltonian is uniformly convex with a positive convexity constant, then we can assert a logarithmic solvative inequality and also a Poincaré inequality for the corresponding generator in this case. This is a very classical statement nowadays, and uh, the first and easiest way to, to prove that is by what is called the Bakri Emery Gamma 2 calculus, which is something which was developed in the early 1980s by French mathematicians Dominique Bakri and Michel Emery. It is something very nice and, and, uh, and efficient. You can find it nowadays everywhere in the literature, and I am give a presentation which follows a survey paper by Yvon Gentil from uh, 2010, but you can also find this in a more elaborate form with more um, examples and more applications and other types of logarithmic solid inequalities in the a recent volume by Bakri, Gentil and Ledoux about the geometry of diffusion uh, operators. So <clears throat> following this approach, of this famous gamma 2 calculus, uh, we proceed as follows. Namely, we know that the generator of this uh, diffusion semigroup in this case has this familiar form. It's the uh, acting on a function f, it's the Laplacian of the function f minus uh, the gradient of h multiplied with the gradient of f. That's the uh, differential operator associated to this generator. And if we assume that the convexity, that the function h, the Hamiltonian, has this convexity, then it has this quadratic growth at infinity, which in particular implies that this um, Hamiltonian exponent of this Gibbs measure, measure is, has a finite total mass. So therefore, without loss of generality, we can assume that the Gibbs measure integrates to 1. So therefore, the equilibrium measure that we shall work with is a probability measure which is exactly of this uh, Gibbs type structure. That will be our measure with regards with, to which we shall work. And now comes um, 
the two central, now come the two central ingredients or qualities, operators, in fact, that uh, will play a central role in our calculations below. It's the two operators which are called the Carré du Champ operator and the iterated Carré du Champ operator for this generator, and they are defined as follows. In the Carré du Champ operator for this diffusion process, acting on a function f is informally defined to be a half of a, the operator a acting on the square of the function, minus two times the product of the function f multiplied with the function with the uh, uh, operation a on f. So it is um, something that in a way um, isolates the first order part in a way of the generator. And if we do the computation in our particular case for this Carré Duchamp operator, we find that the Carré Duchamp operator in this case is just the gradient of f squared. That's our hero of the computations that we shall do below. And uh, let me say again, this hero has the name Carré Duchamp operator, or it sometimes also be ca called the, the uh, square field operator. That would be the English translation for it. So that's the square field operator of this function. And then we can also define and use in the sequel the so-called iterated square field or iterated Carré Duchamp operator, which is obtained from the previous expression, but replacing the product, whenever there is a product, <coughs> replacing the product by uh, this gamma operator, which we have just introduced. So to highlight this gamma thing here is defined in the formula here above as a quadratic operation in F, but by polarization you can uh, expand it to be a bilinear operation. So it is something like a, uh, it is something like, yeah, it's, a, it's like something like a product together with a derivative operation. And the Carré Duchamp iteré, or so the iterated Carré Duchamp operator is obtained by applying the same formula as above, but replacing whenever there is a multiplication operator, multi replacing this multiplication operator with this perturbed multiplication or gradient type multiplication which we had just introduced. So therefore it's called the iterated Carré uh, Duchamp. And if we do the computation in our case for our, um, for our particular operator A, uh, then you will find that <clears throat> for a function F, the iterated Carré Duchamp of order 2 is the Hessian of the function, so the square, the second order derivative of the function, in its full glory, but the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of that. So it's just this, uh, the sum of squares, the Hilbert norm squares, so it's the sum of all second-order derivatives is squared, plus the gradient of f in the inner, in the inner, <coughs> or in the quadratic form, evaluated x, given by the Hessian of the function h of the Hamiltonian. So that's a pointwise evaluation. I should emphasize that this thing here is evaluated at any point. So therefore this returns a function. And if you evaluate this operation at a point x, what we obtain is, if we do the computation in our particular case of the operator A being the gradient uh, drift diffusion equation, then we obtain that the evaluation of gamma 2 on a function f at a position x is the sum of the squares of all second order derivatives of the function, that's one part, and then we get a second component of this expression, which involves first order derivatives of the function f, but these sum of first order derivatives of the function f is aligned in such a way that we can identify that with the, with the following algebraic expression. It's the vectors gradient f of x and gradient f of x inserted into the quadratic form on vectors, which is obtained by means of the weight matrix uh, so, uh, corresponding to the second order derivative of the function h at that point. Okay, so that's the second hero of our computations that we shall do below. We have the Carré Duchamp operator and we have the second order Carré Duchamp operator, and then if we compare these two expressions and relate this to our assumption on the Hessian, on the second order derivative of the function h of the Hamiltonian, we see that if the Hessian 
as a quadratic form is bounded from below by a certain constant k, then we can replace this quadratic form or this this inner product. We can this provides an upper bound for the corresponding norm of the <clears throat> of the two gradients of the gradient of, of f squared. So therefore, we can say that it's effectively an equivalence that the uh, function h, the Hamiltonian, is uniformly k-convex if and only if for all smooth functions on Rd, the corresponding gamma 2 operator acting on that function is bounded, provides an upper bound for the corresponding uh, gamma 1 operator. So if, namely, here's a mistake, namely if for all such functions the gamma 2 operator acting on such a smooth function is an upper bound for k times the gamma 1 operator acting on this function. And this is what is sometimes called the bakri emery gamma 2 condition, or nowadays it is called the curvature dimension condition for curvature, and here I made another mistake, this is the curvature dimension condition for curvature bound k in dimension infinity. So this, uh, this condition appears nowadays in all kinds of contexts where you can identify such a structure. Here we do this identification of a structure in the case of a drift diffusion equation on Euclidean space. But there are more, all this calculus here that I uh, indicate here is applicable to a wider range of uh, Markov processes. And whenever you have such a relation between the corresponding gamma 2 and gamma 1 operators for this generator of this Markov process, you say that the process or the diffusion semigroup satisfies the so-called curvature dimension condition k infinity or Berkeley Emory 2 condition. Okay, so I've introduced all the heroes of our computations that we shall do below, and then we will finally start with the computations that lead to the conclusions of the proposition. So actually there's two more assertions that we have to provide, but without proof that we will use in the computations below. The first assertion is about qualitative conversions towards equilibrium of the semigroup under the assumption that we have a uniformly convex with a positive convexity constant Hamiltonian. In this case, for all functions which are in the L2 space relative to the equilibrium measure, we have that the semigroup uh, converges in L2 sense with respect uh, to that measure towards the equilibrium a distribution or the equilibrium value. So for any function f in that function space, the operation of pt acting on the function, this sequence or yeah, family of function converges to the constant function, which is given just by the mean value of that function or observable with regards to that equilibrium measure. And that's a convergence which takes place in L2. This is a qualitative statement about convergence towards equilibrium. And... Um, it's uh, not a very complicated uh, discussion. We have to combine the uh, convergence or equilibrium distribution arguments that we had before in the, in the segment about the existence of equilibrium distribution together with a statement that there is only one equilibrium distribution. That's a coupling argument, and we will discuss this in the exercise class. And the second assertion which we shall use is about the chain rule for this operator, for in our case, our operator here is a differential operator of second order. So therefore, if we combine a function with an exterior function, so suppose we have a function um, phi, which is smooth, a real valued smooth function, and we have a function which is in the domain of the generator, then if the function phi is compactly supported and smooth, then the composition of f with that function phi will again be in the domain of the generator. And we have the following chain rule that a, the operator applied to phi of f, is then phi prime of f times the operator A, here is a misprint on acting on f, plus phi double prime uh, in, in value in f times the gamma operator in the function f, f. That's uh, one chain rule that we shall use below, and then there's chain rules for the gamma operators, and we shall use only two versions of this chain rule, namely one which we basically had seen already, is that if we take a function f, which is supposedly in the domain of the generator and it's positive or so, 
then we can <coughs> apply to that, we can plug in the log of that function, which is a new function, into the gamma operators. And then by first order chain rule for these gradients, we find that this is 1 over f squared times gamma of ff. And the second chain rule, which is <coughs> a little more complicated, but still can be checked just by direct calculation, is that the gamma 2 operator acting on the log of f, log of f, so again, we write this in this, quadratic form style, this is 1 over f squared times gamma 2 of ff minus 1 over f to the power 3 of gamma of f of gamma of ff plus 1 over f to the 4 times gamma of ff to the squared. So these are <coughs> certain chain rules for these gamma operators that you can check just by um, direct computation. And now finally, we can um, do our magic computations in this gamma-style calculus. We start with the statement about the Poincaré inequality. So in the previous segment, we had a Poincaré inequality, global Poincaré inequality under certain Lyapunov conditions. We could either try to check whether these Lyapunov conditions are satisfied under these convexity con assumptions, but there is a more direct way in this particular case of a strictly convex Hamiltonian which is based on this gamma calculus, and it goes as follows. So as before, we start with the... Uh, so, so the quantity we want to investigate is the variance of such a function, f, with regards to this equilibrium measure. Well, that is, as usual, the L2 norm squared of that function <coughs> against the measure mu minus the mean value of the function squared. And if we take into account the previous lemma that this PT operator is a convergent operation converging to exactly this equilibrium value, we can, um, we can easily understand that um, these two values which are, <coughs> which are on these, which are uh, uh, evaluated at these two different um, points, these correspond to the expression PT of F squared at the two extreme values when t equals zero, in which case we have just p naught of f, which is f squared against the measure mu integrated, which is of course the left-hand side of this um, equation. That's the value that we obtain for t equals uh, zero. <clears throat> and if we evaluate this expression inside this bracket at t equals plus infinity, we see that ptf is nothing but a constant value, so therefore this integration is not uh, uh, really an integration, so just a constant pops out of the integral, and we have that this is just the mean value of, uh, of f at this infinite, uh, with regards to that equilibrium measure. So therefore, the two quantities which we, uh, which we consider here in this difference are the extreme values of this pt operation acting on the function f when squared and integrated against the measure mu. And therefore, by fundamental theorem of calculus, we can obtain this difference by just doing the differentiation and integration against the time parameter t and evaluating this in the integral uh, from 0 to infinity, but with a minus sign in order to account for the right difference or for the right sign that we have in the line above. Okay, but now we have again um, an, an, an expectation or an integral with regards to the mu measure which depends on the time parameter, and uh, by the regularity assumption that we want to impose, we can <clears throat> move the time derivative inside this mu integral, which by Leibniz rule and our definition of the operator A produces twice the product of A PTF times PTF integrated against the mu. Well, Together with the minus sign and the a, what we have here <coughs> is exactly, uh, again, our uh, gamma operator acting on ptf and ptf integrated against the mu. That's just a consequence of integration by parts. If you like, we could also equivalently replace this mu integral just by the corresponding Dirichlet form, and we know that the Dirichlet form uh, involves only the integral of the gamma operator on the function <coughs> yeah, here in this quadratic version integrate against the measure mu, so therefore we obtain this expression here. So we see that this variance of f can be written as, a, as an infinite integral of a certain quantity which involves this gamma operation, 
And so if we <clears throat> introduce the real valued function in T, which is exactly this scalar number, which is integrated with respect to time here above, so this whole mu integral here at time t is what I shall call phi of t. And I want to evaluate the evolution of this phi quantity. And I do that by doing a second, another time derivative. So all this Barclay-Emery calculus typically involves considering second order derivatives in time of the corresponding um, evolving quantities which evolve over time. So let's let me say it again, we consider this function phi, capital phi, which is a real valued function, and which is the function which we need to integrate over the whole, whole non-negative time axis in order to evaluate the variance. Okay, and in order to get an estimate on this integral in phi, we perform another differentiation of that phi function with respect to that time parameter. Okay, <clears throat> so if we do that, uh, we see that this is a, this, okay, look, if we look into the phi guy, it's a, it's a, it's a bilinear or quadratic form which involves the, pi, uh, the, the PT operation. And since gamma is linear in each of its com components, uh, we have, uh, again, a, a Leibniz formula with regards to this time derivative. So therefore, we get twice, and it's, and it's symmetric, so we get twice, for the time derivative, we get, we get twice the gamma operator, but now in, uh, involving the A, the operator, acting on PTF against PTF. So in other words, if I perform a D by DT in, in one of these two factors, which insert, which in, uh, are appearing in the gamma operator, I obtain an A, an A PTF, and this is exactly what appears twice if I apply the Leibniz rule to this bilinear gamma operator. So therefore, doing the time derivative of that function with respect to time brings up 2 times 2 equals 4 times the expression which is the integral against mu of gamma of A PTF against PTF. Okay, now I take a look at this term and I realize that this almost looks like the gamma 2 operator because the gamma 2 operator, our iterated Carré de Champ operator, it involved exactly an expression of this type when we have to take uh, something like a mixed application of A to, to a function multiplied with another function in the gamma operator. So the gamma 2 operator that I want to bring into the calculation now is by definition nothing but one half. So this guy, if I write that out, this is what is it? It's one half of um, a of gamma ptf ptf minus two times gamma of a ptf ptf. So. And I see that uh, this gamma of A PTF PTF, that's exactly the term which I had encountered here in this computation. So I can replace <clears throat> this two times gamma guy by a linear combination of A of gamma PTF PTF and exactly the gamma two term. So inserting this produces inside the mu integral a one half A gamma PTF PTF minus gamma 2 PTF PTF. And now I want to argue that if, if I integrate, also if I insert this, this sum of these two terms as a replacement for what I have here inside the integral, I want to argue now that the first of these two terms, which involves a global application of this A operator, uh, does not contribute to my to my sum after integration. Why is this so? Well, I take any smooth function, suppose, and I'm asking myself, what's a h against the mu integral? Well, I claim that by invariance of the measure mu with regards to the semigroup, this integral will always uh, be zero. Why so? Well, 
By definition, A of H is this limit of this difference quotient of PTH minus H. By duality, I can map these operations onto the right-hand side. So that's 1 over T, so the limit of this difference quotient, 1 over TH against PT star mu mu. But PT star is a semigroup which leaves mu invariant by the assumption on mu. So therefore, uh, this produces a zero, if at least H is in the domain of the operator. So I want to assume that the quantities which are here are smooth enough such that this is the case. So if f is a very smooth function, and that, that will certainly uh, be the case. That will even be in this particular case true without any assumptions on f, but that's, that's a different story. That's again some regularity theory that we would want to do, or local regularity theory that we want to do for the single PTF. So we will not um, discuss the details of this. So Using this argument for the case when the H function is of this type, we find that after integration, as a matter of fact, the first of two, these two sums does not contribute. So that's the conclusion that's written here. So this part here does not contribute to <clears throat> the integral, which I have, um, which I have established. And so therefore, the only thing that remains in the integral is four times this integral of the, of the gamma 2 against the mu. So therefore the phi prime of t, that was my computation, equals minus 4 times the gamma 2 of PTF PTF. Now finally comes in uh, what I know about the, the gamma relation. I know by assumption that uh, gamma 2 is uh, greater or equal to plus, in fact, k times gamma of 1. So therefore, if I insert this inequality uh, in the other direction, I find that this minus gamma 2 is less or equal than minus 4k times gamma 1 ptf ptf, uh, which, if I look what's in, written here, so gamma 1 of ptf and ptf is exactly my phi of t function. So I see, in fact, that uh, phi prime of t, that was my starting point, phi prime of t is less or equal than minus 2 times k times phi of t. And again, I see that this is a Grunwald structure, which allows me to write the, or to establish the upper bound that phi of t is bounded from above by e to the minus 2kt times phi of naught. And if I write down again what the phi of naught is, phi of naught was 2 times gamma f f of mu. Okay, that's good news. So I have established now an exponential bound on this phi function. And now returning to my initial computation, or my initial question, about an estimation of the variance of mu with regards, um, the variance of phi f with regards to, to mu. My first step was to represent this quantity as an, as an <clears throat> time integral over this phi function, but the phi function in its own right is estimated from above by this exponential, exponentially decaying uh, function. So therefore I can insert this upper estimate into this integral and write down or compute the remaining explicit integral which produces a factor of 1 over 2k. But writing out again what phi of naught is, this consumes 1, 2. I want to factor 2 because phi was phi of naught was exactly this value, uh, which was this part here. So putting in this value <coughs> produces uh, exactly this bound. And therefore, my Poincare inequality is established. In order to establish the logarithmic Sobolev inequality under this convexity assumption, I will pursue a quite similar path, but this one is slightly more complicated in terms of the computations that need to be done. So let's assume we have a function f, which is smooth and non-negative, and assume that it integrates against the measure mu to 1. Then we consider the corresponding measure mu, which is given in terms of mu and f as a radon nukodym density. And the entropy, as we've seen, of mu against the measure mu is just this integral of log f 
f against mu. And um, if I um, apply again the semigroup uh, to this function, then um, I want to look at the corresponding quantity at intermediate times for the corresponding measures nu t. And I've seen already that this is uh, corresponds to the, the the entropy. Then is the integral of p t f of x against log p t f of x against the mu d t of x. And let us have a look at these two quantities at the extreme time points t equals zero and t equals not. Well, at t equals zero, at t equals zero, I just have uh, f times log f of x. That's exactly uh, then the, the corresponding integral is exactly the entropy that I'm asking for. So the, at this quantity here at time t equals zero is exactly my uh, entropy. And if I take a look at t equals at t equals uh, one, then I find that this is. Um, at t equals infinity correction, then ptf uh, converges exactly to the constant function 1, because this is um, the equilibrium value of the function f. So therefore, I'm ending up with the integral of 1 times log of 1, but the log of 1 is 0, so therefore at time t equals plus infinity, the corresponding integral uh, does not contribute. So therefore, the entropy that I want to compute can be understood as the, the difference of the extreme values of this, the difference of the function, <clears throat> the difference of the values of this function here, which is a function of time, at the times t equals plus infinity minus the time t, minus the value at the time t equals zero, but with a minus sign. And so therefore, again, by fundamental theorem of calculus, I can write this as an integral over the whole non-negative real line of the time derivative of this function. So, writing, so, so that's, that's what I write, and so then I do the time differentiation inside the mu integral by moving the time derivative inside. And then again by basically the computation that we already did. This is uh, A of PTF, ln PTF plus PTF times 1 over PTF times A PTF against mu. And uh, this again cancels out to, to be uh, the constant function 1. And I've seen already that anything smooth inserted into the operator A and then integrated against the measure mu produces a zero contribution. So therefore, the only part that really matters is this first integral, which I write out separately. So that's what I obtain. And again, I can write this, as we had seen already, as the gamma operator <coughs> by an integration by parts. This is nothing but the gamma operator acting on PTF uh, and ln of PTF, which then as a function is integrated against the measure mu and uh, and that whole thing, again, by my first step, needs to be integrated with respect to the time axis, with respect to the non-negative time, or with respect to time on the non-negative time axis. Okay, so that's the integral that I want to compute. So it's a similar thing as above. Above we had managed to write down the variance of a function as a certain time integral over the non-negative real line, which involves the... The, the heat flow or the corresponding flow of the semigroup acting on the function of a certain function phi. And now we have managed to do a similar thing. We have managed to write our entropy that we want to control as the time integral of a certain function phi, psi in this case, over the non-negative real axis with regards to the time, where the psi function involves uh, some operation or some combination of operations of this semigroup acting on the function f. And our goal is now to derive bounds on this function psi, which after integration produce the desired estimate. To derive bounds on the function psi, we will do, as we did above, another differentiation of the psi function with respect to time. So writing psi like this, 
which is uh, just the integral of 1 over PTF times the gamma operator acting on PTF and PTF, which is correct by chain rule for the gradient. We therefore can uh, compute the time derivative of this, of this function. So the function inside the integral depends, if you like, in, has, is a product of two functions which depend on time. So therefore, by Leibniz rule, if we do first the time integration of the gamma operator with respect to time, we get it 2 because of the bilinearity of this gamma in T and of its symmetry. Gamma of acting now on A PTF, PTF against PTF. And then we have a second derivative, which comes from the time derivative of the first factor, which by chain rule is a minus 1 over PTF squared times A PTF gamma PTF PTF. That's the terms which we obtain. And now it is useful to insert another zero, which I write as a particular form. So assuming smoothness and so forth, I can um, insert a zero by writing an integral with respect to mu of A of something. And this something that I want to choose is a particular type. It's gamma of PTF, PTF over PTF. So I have done nothing except that I have inserted a zero, and which I wrote in this particular form. Now in the sequel, we shall write, instead of for ease of notation, we shall write H instead of PTF. And uh, now I want to expand this by my chain rule, or by my set of, cha sets, set of chain rules for this operator A. I will now expand this A of gamma of H and gamma of H. So exactly this term inside the integration I shall now in, uh, expand. First, by using uh, the product rule <clears throat> for this operator. So, if we—that's another um, simple consequence of the of the fact that we have a explicit partial differential operator of, of second order linear. We can uh, convince ourselves of the following: that the A operator acting on a product is something like a Leibniz-style rule. So it's the first factor times A acting on the second component plus the A operator acting on the first component times the second component. That would be, if you like, a plain Leibniz formula for the second-order operator, which does not exist because it's a second-order operator. So we have a correction that comes from the from the fact that it is effectively a second order operator, and that is in this case two times the gamma operator acting on the two on the on the on the pair of the two factors. So that's if you like your Leibniz rule <coughs> for this second order uh, uh, type operator. It corresponds, uh, by the way, to um, the decomposition of uh, it's basically something like the Ito formula. For the quadratic variation of a product of two processes. That's, that's basically what it is. And then after I expanded this formula in this fashion, I will now uh, do one more expansion, namely I will expand this A over 1 over H by now a um, straightforward uh, calculation or as calculation, yeah, the, the, the basically it's the calculation that we did in um, that we did not do, but which I just presented as the chain rule for this A operator in one of my previous lemmas. So one of my previous lemmas said that if I have A acting on the composition of a function f with an exterior function phi, then I can expand this in this fashion. And it's the first order derivative of the exterior function acting on f times A acting on f plus phi double prime acting on f times gamma f of f. So, that, so that's, the, that's the formula that I shall use now, now for the case that my phi function is in fact uh, phi of t, if you like, my exterior function is 1 over t. This is not quite a C2 function and not with bound, well, not with compact support, but uh, with appropriate regularization or cutoff arguments, I can try to convince myself that after approximation such a formula is also true at least when uh, the local partial derivatives are involved. So I use this formula now for the case that the exterior function phi is the inverse function, or the, the inverse of identity. Uh, that's 
here, so I arrived at, so I want to apply this formula now to A over 1 over H. So I'm doing this and I obtain uh, exactly what? I obtain minus 2 over H squared of uh, gamma H H plus 1 over H A gamma of H H plus 2 over H to the power 3 of gamma H H times gamma H H minus 1 over H squared A H gamma H H. This is what I obtained after expanding this this uh, A over 1 H uh, formula. Okay, and as a matter of fact, I did uh, two things in one go, namely I also expanded this 1 over H term in this gamma operation. So gamma operation in one factor allows for a conventional chain rule of first order, so that's this part, so there's minus 2 over h squared, which is coming from taking the exterior function out of this term, so therefore I'm left up with this. So this guy here produces this guy here after I pull out the 1 over h exterior function and out of the gamma operator. Then this term here remains unchanged in the transition to this formula, and here finally I do my expansion that I <clears throat> had just discussed with this exterior function. So this uh, produces um, the second order derivative of this inverse function, which is 2 over h3 times the gamma of this h with itself. That's this part here. And that was uh, combined with the factor gamma of h h. So therefore, this gamma of h h appears, in fact, uh, in the power of 2. Then I had also this first order expansion which says I need to uh, take out this the exterior function which is 1 over t. I need to differentiate that. This is minus 1 over t squared. In, evaluate this as t equals h and then that needs to be multiplied with the a operator acting on the function h. Okay, so this way I have convinced myself that <clears throat> Uh, that, that this expansion is correct. It's just chain rule, in, after all. All this is essentially chain rule for this uh, partial differential operator, but uh, this, all this gamma business basically is an attempt to produce some order, of, to, to order all these terms which are appearing in all these chain rule and integration by parts. So, now, if I plug in this long and lengthy expansion into this zero term which I had just introduced into my formula above. Then I have a certain number of cancellations, namely what cancels is um, the 1 over h squared term. And if I properly collect the terms that um, survive after this insertion, I find this that this is a 1 over h, 2 gamma a h h minus a of gamma h h and so forth. So I'll just uh, leave it to you to uh, make these computations yourself and check that these terms are actually really surviving. And then uh, when we look closer right to these terms, again, what do we see? Let me have another look. Yes, so if we take a look at this, so this guy here is a 2 of gamma h h minus a of gamma h h. That is, in fact, the formula for the gamma 2 operator acting on the function h, right? So we have a acting on this modified square of the function h minus 2 times the modified product of a h with h which means that the first term here in the first line here is nothing but the negative of the gamma 2 operator acting on H, which allows me to write this previous formula in a slightly simplified form. It's the gamma 2, which is there over H, plus 2 over H squared gamma of this term and minus 2 over H here over gamma this term squared. 
And then I can uh, multiply this whole thing with an h, and I get a 1 over h squared and all these terms uh, below. And if I then uh, compare what I have here with my formula of the previous, of the previous lemma for the gamma 2 acting on the log of a function, so that's this formula, gamma 2 acting on the log of a function produces this expansion in three terms with increasing orders of the function f in the denominator, or powers of the function f in the denominator. If I do that and compare, I find that, in fact, I'm having inside this uh, integration nothing but a minus 2 times h times gamma 2 acting on the log of the function. And now, ultimately, I can insert my gamma 2 condition, which tells me that this gamma 2 of log log is greater or equal to kappa or k times gamma 1 of log log. So inserting this inequality, I find that this negative is then bounded from above by the negative of k times h, that's just a non-negative function, times gamma 1 on log log. Now I take a look again, what's gamma 1 of log log? Well, uh, gamma 1 of log log, that's uh, something like um, a grad squared over h squared, which then meets, meets an h, which altogether is something like grad h squared over h, which is, uh, should be psi in some way. Let's convince ourselves what was psi again that we started with. Psi of n was exactly 1 over ptf gamma ptf ptf, which I can also write as an ptf times gamma of log log f. So therefore I really see, by the chain rule again, that this term here on the right hand side is nothing but psi. Hallelujah! This is what we wanted, because then again by Gronwell inequality we can conclude that psi of t is less or equal than e to the minus 2kt times psi of naught where psi of naught is f times uh, gamma log log f, or which, in other words, is 1 over f times grad f squared, which is uh, this Fisher information in this particular case. So plugging this estimate for the psi function into my representation of this entropy, in the time integral, so I'm writing it out again. So I started out with this. This is just my entropy of mu against the mu. Then I was able to write this as an integral over the psi function. But the psi function could be estimated by this exponential formula. So therefore the whole thing is uh, less or equal here is a, is a plus, I guess. And, and so therefore the whole thing altogether is a one over two, is less or equal than 1 over 2k times the psi of zero, which is exactly my logarithmic Sobolev inequality that I wanted uh, to establish. So you see, it's a, it's a kind of complicated <clears throat> computation, and it involves basically taking the second order derivative in time of the entropy along the action of my semigroup. That's the magic here. And the magic also is that if you do proper integration by parts, which, and if you collect the terms and do proper bookkeeping of all the terms, you find that there is a, a Gronwald structure showing up, which comes from the fact that the gamma 2 is an upper bound for the gamma 1, uh, which allows you to, do, uh, to, to conclude. So uh, that's a famous computation. After all, it's a PDE kind of computation. You do time derivatives of certain functions or functionals of the solution along the flow, and you come up with certain inequalities, or you insert certain inequalities, which help you to provide to to identify a ground rule structure, which then help you to conclude. So this was this famous gamma two calculus by Buckley and Emery. It's ingenious and wonderful. And uh, once you have established the mechanics of this computation, you don't have to do it any any time again in your life. In in a way, once you convince yourself that this computation is true. So in a concrete situation. Basically, the only thing, so to say, you have to make sure is that this gamma two condition is satisfied. So, as a meta theorem, you could ask, you could, you could just 
keep in mind, or you can just write down that if you have this gamma 2 Bakri Emery condition, then you will automatically, by this computation which I had just shown to you, you can automatically um, conclude that there is a logarithmic subordinate inequality for your, for your diffusion process. However, there are many situations when such a wonderful uniform convexity condition on the potential is not present. And then, of course, you would still want to know whether there is a logarithmic solvative inequality. And here I would like to mention one nice and beautiful result, which is by, um, by French mathematicians Catio guillain vu which appeared in Probability Theory and Related Fields 2010, which allows to establish logarithmic subordinate inequality under a Lyapunov style condition, which is reminiscent of the Lyapunov condition that we have seen for the Poincaré inequality. And uh, whenever you come to check whether log sub is correct under non-convex, under non-uniform convexity assumptions, this paper would probably be your starting point where you want to check if uh, alternative arguments can be applied. Okay, that concludes our two-semester journey through um, some elements of stochastic process theory. We have not quite managed to discuss relevant physical models in much detail that is partially due to the particular circumstances of uh, our class in this semester. Uh, but I'm confident that with the material that we have presented in these two lectures, you will be able basically to um, understand roughly the messages of many uh, contemporary research, much of the contemporary research literature on physics and stochastic process theory so um, you have now the means and the tools assembled in order to confront yourself with uh, more advanced and contemporary questions, which might lead uh, to interesting research projects in your further career. Thanks for your attention and uh, stay tuned. <laughs>